Welcome to Parker's MMA Show. If you want to learn about all things going down in the fight world, you've come to the right place. Each episode, your host, Parker Keen, will take a deeper dive into the always entertaining world of sanctioned fist fighting. Now, here's your host, Parker Keen. All right, let's do it. Episode 23, Parker's MMA Show, back in your life. What's going on? This is our Jordan episode, Parker. This has got to be our greatest of all time, man. Let's do it. A lot of pressure. A lot of pressure. So let's just get into it. We got a lot to talk about, and we got about an hour. So let's get after it. UFC Houston went down last weekend. Um, a lot of controversy around the main event, John Jones versus Dom Reyes. How did you score it live, and have you rewatched it once, twice, how many times, and, and what do you think? What's your final conclusion on how the judges did? Did they get it right, or did they screw it up? So I scored it 3-2 live I uh, for John Jones, um, and I've rewatched it once. I still give him rounds 3, 4, and 5, to be honest. Right. Um, so I score it the same live that I did uh, on rewatch, but... I will say on the rewatch, uh, I think round two is a lot closer than people want to give John credit for. I don't think Dom really lands his shots in that round. I and agree. Round I three, agree. round three is a complete toss up. So everyone's killing the judge who gave it four one Jones and gave him two through five. But I actually don't think it's that crazy for me. Dominic Reyes won it, but uh, round one round two, but. I still think John won the fight. I I think really this I hope opens up a larger conversation about judging in MMA and what's important and what's not. But I had John winning three four five three two John Jones. I think the right guy won the fight. So live I had it three to two Reyes. Um, I've I've watched it twice since. Both both times I scored it three to two Jones. Um, Rewatching it. I agree with you. Um, everyone was throwing a big hoopla about round two going John's way. But honestly, I think on first glance, it looked a lot worse than it was. Because, I mean, Dom Reyes was chasing him down, throwing big haymakers. But he really didn't land anything. And I, I think round two is where he really, he kind of gassed. He thought he had John hurt and was trying to put him away. And I, I think he's going to look back on that and, you know, think, think maybe he should have conserved his energy a little more. But, um, yeah, I, I agree with you. I, I thought round two could have actually went to John, and then round three to me was a toss-up. Uh, four and five, I had John winning. Just, you know, I think he was able to pace himself better and, and just get through the fight. And then, you know, obviously the takedowns helped. And he really started to pick Dom apart a little bit as Dom got more tired. But, yeah, that, that's how I scored it. Um, very, very close fight. I, I honestly would not have been mad with the draw. I think it was close enough where we could have seen a draw. Yeah, I agree with you. But you know how this goes. I mean, you've watched enough fights now, and I've watched enough fights now yeah. to know we don't really see draws in MMA, certainly not in five-round title fights. I think the last one I remember is is Woodley against Stephen Thompson, which I actually thought was a more decisive fight than this one was. So uh, we'll see. Um, but I, I I don't think we see draws, and I really did have it three two Jones uh, both times I watched it. So I'm I'm honestly I'm satisfied with the result. Yeah, I heard Luke Thomas made a um, comparison that John Jones is the Canelo Alvarez of MMA. It just seems anytime it's a close decision, he's going to find a way to to sway the judges over. And I, I think it's just the way he fights. He's just so consistent. I mean, even though it's a slowed down John Jones, he's getting older. He's just constantly marching you down, mixing it up. And it's just, I mean, it's really hard to keep that pace for five rounds. So what's funny to me is you have all these people talking about like, oh, these judges don't know what they're watching. Mm -hmm. You know, they don't understand MMA, blah, 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 all this stuff. But really what I was impressed with John is the defensive fighting. And it was I didn't unbelievable. Think, 
I didn't think Dominic Reyes landed a lot of clean shots in round two. Mm -hmm. And that to me is really what separates like a casual from a hardcore fan is being able to recognize when someone's doing good things defensively. And, you know, even though Dom is throwing the majority of the punches, it's what's landing clean, what's actually hurting John or causing damage or being effective in the striking department. And I didn't think round two was all that decisive. I didn't think there were that many clean shots. Like outside of round one, I didn't think there was a single round that Dom won clearly. Round round two, he looked like Roy Jones dodging those. <laughs> it was crazy. His head movement was unbelievable when he was up against the cage. And I think Dom thought he had him clipped. And it was fucking a, a work of art, his head movement. It was unbelievable. Um, and I really got a good appreciation for that on my second watch. I mean, I was able to slow it down and kind of rewatch that sequence a couple times, but that was just incredible. I actually thought that Dom, Dom, Dom had him hurt in round four early, you know, the first minute or so. And that was the only time I thought John was, was hurt. Besides that, I think he was able to just roll with the punches and kind of slip off of those punches just enough. Um, but yeah, that that was really the only time I I saw him hurt, and it was really early in that first or the fourth round, and and John took him down like, you know, maybe a minute and thirty seconds into the fourth round. So, yeah, okay. Um, well, yeah, I just wanted to see what you thought on the scoring. Um, let's roll into that. So, what did you think of the judging as a whole on the night? I know there was a lot of, you know, there was a lot of people bitching about the judging and how ridiculous it was, and it was in in some of the fights. I think the John Jones Dom Reyes judging was blown a little out of proportion, but the James Krause fight, the Andre Ewell fight, um, some of those they had some crazy scorecards at the end. The the James Krause round one scorecard yeah. where you had one judge give that to Trevin Giles, where James Krause literally set up a picnic, four chairs, basket on uh on Trevin Giles back for the majority of that round. I mean, how you could look, my grandmother could watch that fight and tell you that James Krause won that fight and she's never watched any MMA in her entire life. So that so was, that was the same judge that gave John the four to one that Joe Salinas and he's the crazy thing is he owns a jujitsu school in Houston. He's a black belt in jujitsu. And I, I just don't, I, I don't see any way that he could give that round to Giles. That was the craziest shit I've ever seen. James James Krause had his back for at least four minutes of that first round. Yeah, and then the Andre Ewell decision is just, I mean, it's awful. I mean, thank God that uh, he he ended up losing that fight and the, wrong, the right guy won because, I mean, the, you're cutting these guys' paychecks in half when they did their job. I mean, right. it, it's... It's horrible to to think about. And I know judging is a thankless job. And, you know, we, you never hear us get on this podcast or any other podcast and say, oh, wow, what great judging out of the uh, commission tonight. Um, these guys never get complimented when they do their job well. But at the end of the day, like, you know, you're you're dealing with someone's livelihood here. And, yeah. and I just I wish there was better training and, and more appreciation for what these guys do in, in the cage and, and understanding that how important your job is as a judge. Yeah. Explain a little bit um, how Texas is set up. I, I know Texas is, is known to be on the old unified rule set. Whereas like California, Nevada, New York, New Jersey are all on an updated unified rule. So explain that a little bit. So I think the biggest difference and the most applicable difference here, uh, specifically with this card, is is in the way that the fights are scored. So uh, in Texas, the idea is the effective striking and grappling carries the same weight as this term called control of the fighting area. So in my mind, the way that that is scored is like, John was able to move forward in this fight, and he was the one who was controlling the octagon in addition to having roughly equal effective striking and grappling to Dom Reyes. So Under it's basically unified it's, rules. It's basically if they if the striking and the grappling are even, then they use the ring aggression or whoever's coming forward to 
give the edge or how does that work? So under the unified rules, effective striking and grappling is the most important thing. Right. And octagon control is like way down the list. It's almost never used because there's other, you know, damage and other things like that are considered more important. Whereas Texas puts control of the fighting area as the same weight as effective striking and grappling. So they're judging all these things with equal weight. And I think that's what really changed the scoring is John is, was able to not only have equal striking in many respects to Dom Reyes, but he was the one moving forward for the majority of the fight. He was the one controlling the center of the octagon. And so I think that factored into the judges' decisions a lot compared to other states. Yeah, so what what do you think could be done to update or change or try to eliminate a lot of the controversy we're having with MMA judging and scoring? I think we need to get rid of round by round scoring to be honest. I think the the round structure in MMA is meant to refresh the fighters and allow them to get coaching. It's not so that a fight can be treated basically as three separate fights or five separate fights. I, you had Mark Goddard got on Ariel Helwani's show this week and described how he judges fights. And he really described it as each round is a separate fight. And to me, that's a very bad way to judge an MMA fight because I think it was clear to everyone watching that, especially in the fourth and fifth, Dom was fading. And mm -hmm. if th that had gone to a sixth, seventh, eighth round, or if that was on the street and there was no time limit, John Jones would have won that fight. Right. And so to me, judging the fight as a whole is really the biggest change we can make in MMA, similar to the way that one championship judges it, because it allows you to use a round one or the first few minutes of round one to really gauge your opponent, figure out what they're trying to do, and then bait them into it later in the fight, which in my mind is the sign of a true martial artist. Yeah, I, I heard Big John McCarthy say the way he looks at it the way he views judging is basically at the end of every round, which fighter would you rather be is the easiest way that he thinks of it. So I, I don't know. I, my thing is with that, if they, I mean, if they can't score individual rounds, right, how are they going to score a whole fight? Right. I actually think it's easier than trying to score individual rounds because I think you can look at the end of that fight Look at their faces, look at their demeanor, look at how they finished that fight. And just like you said, think about which fighter would you rather be? I mean, Dom Reyes had red marks all over his face and John Jones had like a bloody nose and looked relatively clean. I mean, who would you rather be there? That's yeah. my question. I'd much rather be John Jones and I don't even think it's controversial. So... The, I think the trying to score individual rounds is what actually invites the controversy rather than thinking about it as the fight as a whole, I think is much, much easier to score because you really go on that 25 minute journey with these two fighters rather than trying to, it's like trying to watch a movie in like 10 minute segments. It's much easier to watch the two hours than it is in 10 minute segments. Well, my thing is there's got to be a way to get more people on there as judges, more qualified judges, so more training, maybe ex-fighters, or even, I mean, there's got to be some sort of computer system, something that's better than three people that are ex-boxing judges trying to look at MMA and figure out what the hell is going on. So my thing with, with a couple of those suggestions, so if we're looking to get more judges, where's the money coming from? Mm -hmm. Because this is a this is a thankless underpaid job as it is. You know, they might pay a grand or twelve hundred dollars for a title fight in the UFC for these guys, and they have to sacrifice their basically their entire weekend and pay their own travel costs to get to the arena. So that's one. Where's the money coming from? Mm -hmm. The second the second one with more training and more knowledge in that, I mean, there's like eight to ten guys in the entire world that are really qualified MMA judges. And the reality is, is there's so much depth to the sport. I mean, there are professional fighters who don't even understand the, the full techniques and the, like what everyone is trying to do in every single fight. So I think the idea that we're going to get, you know, 
dozens and dozens of qualified judges who understand every aspect of MMA is kind of a pipe dream. And then the the idea of X fighters, I think in some cases is good, but in some cases you're going to get guys who are really biased, not just towards their gym yeah. or their training partners, but biased towards the discipline that they grew up with. So a guy like Lovato might be biased towards jujitsu. Right. Daniel Cormier is biased towards wrestling. A guy like McGregor would be more biased towards striking. So I think you're going to run into a situation where the judges are still biased and it's just not a realistic option. So I, I think you actually need to change the way that we judge fights and the criteria we use to judge fights rather than expecting that we're just going to get all these quality judges uh, that when really it's, it's just not a realistic proposition. Yeah, or I've, I've even thought about some sort of point system. I mean, but then that gets very sub subjective. I mean, if you're counting takedowns, you know, strikes, what the damage is, I, I don't know. I, I don't know the answer. I, I think, I, I don't know. I mean, you, you see boxing's been around forever and there's still crazy scores and corrupt judges and I don't know. Maybe Elon I mean, Musk can help figure Parker, it out. Parker, we'd have it solved. I think Joe Rogan needs to call Elon Musk and figure it out. <laughs> I mean, we could, I think we could get the brightest minds in the world on this and we still wouldn't have a situation that MMA fans are happy with. The reality is a close fight is a close fight. Same way you're going to nitpick a basketball game or a right. football game where a play could have gone different or a penalty call or a foul call, whatever it is. That's how fighting goes too. And the reality is, is that sports. So I think we could do the best we can with trying to find a scoring criteria that, that suits us. But at the end of the day, every solution is going to be an imperfect solution. Right. Um, all right. One more thing on the judging. What did, what did you think about the idea of showing live scorecards? I, I personally really like that idea. I think as a fan, it, it's maybe going to draw people in a little more. You're going to get behind the minds of the judges a little bit. And then I think making that more public might out some of these judges like that. What was the lady um, who had the like five bogus calls in a row? She, she does boxing and Adelaide bird, Adelaide bird, um, letting the public get behind these people and it kind of expose them a little more. I think that'll help weed out the ones that are just making crazy decisions that aren't qualified, but also I think it's going to help the fighters too. Like, I think Dom Reyes would have loved to see that he was behind going into that fifth round or whatever. And he could dig deep and just know where he's at. I, I think there's so much going on in an MMA fight. I think that's a, something that'd be really good for the fighters. If they knew exactly where they were at, you know, after each round, I, I, I just think, I think that's a no brainer to add that. I, I heard today that I think the Kansas commission is going to give that a try in MMA and see how that goes. So I, I'd be very interested to see how that goes. Yeah, so Kansas is going to give it a try with an Invicta event, which uh -huh. is exactly where this should be tested. You, you can't test this in the UFC right. right off the bat. You have to vet it in, in one of these smaller organizations. So I really applaud Invicta for taking a risk and doing this. Um, I like the idea of open scoring, but what I would say is there's typically anywhere from about 22 to 26 fighters on a given card. Right. And they all have to weigh in. Why don't at weigh-ins, we just have them submit an anonymous ballot that says whether or not they want open scoring for that card and give them an option. And if the majority of the fighters on the card want open scoring, then you have it. And if the majority of fighters don't, then you don't have it. And that yeah. way you're giving the empowering the fighters to choose whether or not they want to know what the judges' scorecards are. And if we start to see trends with it, then we can go one way or the other. But at least we're asking the fighters what they would prefer, which is something we don't do enough in this sport. Yeah, and, and the big argument against it is I've heard, you know, say John Jones was up four to one that he's just going to run the fifth round. But to me, that goes the other way. That lets the other guy know that, hey, I need a finish here or I'm going to lose this decision unanimously. So that that's kind of where I'm at on that. But I, I've seen a lot of people bringing that up this week. Yeah, I think the, the running argument is fair. But at the same time, how many fights have we seen where the guys just gassed 
and he yeah. can't pick up his arms to fight anymore, and he's running in the third or the fifth round anyway. So yeah. I, I, don't, I don't really think that's a real argument. I don't think having open scoring would mean more running or less running. I don't think you can mail it in for five minutes in an MMA fight, no matter how many points you're up. So uh, I, I, I'm for it, but I would really like to get fighter input on this because at the end of the day, that's who it affects. Yeah. The last thing on the scoring, do you think we're going to see another title fight in the near future in Texas? I do. I do. I think the uh, the Houston market is too big to ignore. Yeah, I think, you know, the the allure of having an MMA event one day in Cowboys Stadium is kind of a fantasy for the UFC. So mm-hmm. I, I think one day we'll, we'll see that again. And uh, I, I just I think that the, the Texas market has been one that's embraced MMA and has a ton of MMA fans. So I, I think I think we will see one again. You know, maybe not again this year, but definitely in the future. All right, let's move on. Um, So what did you think or what do you make of the current John Jones that we're seeing? Do you do you see it as a guy that's been at the top of the heap, you know, fighting the best of the best? for the last 10 years and maybe he's wearing down or do you see it that this new crop, the Corey Anderson's, the Dominic Reyes the Anthony Smith's, the Johnny Walker's that they just have so much tape on him that maybe they're collectively piecing a game plan together to take him out. So I have kind of five theories, I would say on what's going on with John Jones and, and I bounce between them all the time of what I think is happening. The first one I think is, is Dom Reyes is just that good. You know, he was an undefeated prospect. He's Mm -hmm. super athletic. You know, I told you uh, before the fight, he's got great footwork and great Mm -hmm. boxing and he used it in this fight. And so I I think, you know, the, the tape argument and the game plan argument is, is certainly a fair one. Uh, The second one, which I think a lot of the John Jones conspiracy theorists love is that John Jones got caught cheating with steroids with Ball, and you know now we're seeing a not doped up john jones and mm-hmm. he's just not as good um which i don't necessarily think that but it's definitely out there mm-hmm. i think the third the third one is that john jones is a guy who's been at the top of the sport for 10 years and he was a, a very intense wrestler before this and his body's just wearing down and typically the wrestling is the first thing that goes. And I think we saw that a little bit in this fight where, you know, he's just not as dynamic as he used to be. I, I think um, that toe injury has a lot to do with it. You, you see he has it wrapped up. And if anyone, anyone hasn't seen that against Chelsea and he broke that toe where the bone was, I mean, sticking out. It was disgusting. And I don't know if, I mean, if that hinders the way he's able to wrestle. Yeah, maybe. And I just think the joints wear down. I think, yeah. you know, your knees wear down and your ability to push off on on takedowns is it, it gets worse as you go on. I mean, there's a reason you don't see Olympic wrestlers, you know, deep into their 30s and 40s. So, um, you know, I think that's certainly an option. I think the fourth one I think about is John is playing it safe and yeah. just wants to maintain his title, doing the least work possible. And then the the fifth one is that he's either simply unmotivated or he's running the show so much at Jackson Wink that he just isn't training all that hard for these fights. And and so when he gets in there, he's kind of coasting on natural ability. And it's not because he game planned and not because he worked really hard. But I, I don't I don't really have a great answer for which one of those theories it is, but I think there's a lot of options for what we're seeing out of John Jones, but clearly what we're seeing is is a diminished product compared to even the Gustafson two fight. I think he he looked way better than he's looked in any of his last three fights. Yeah, I I I, I don't know. I think he's made the motivation may be a thing. Like he you know he's been through all these legends like we talked about last week. That maybe he just can't get up for the Dom Reyes's, Anthony Smith's, the Corey Andersons of the world, which I think is very dangerous because eventually that's going to catch up to him. I mean, you can see the last two fights, really, uh, Tiago Santos and then Dominic Reyes, those guys pushed him to the brink and Tiago Santos did it on two bum knees. So I don't know. I, I'm 
I didn't get a lot of answers where John is at currently. I just think he, you know, his overall game and his experience in these championship fights are able to carry him through just because he's been there. He's done that against the best of his generation at light heavyweight. Um, What I was really impressed with was his defense. His defense is spectacular. I mean, he is the Floyd Mayweather of MMA. He rarely, rarely gets hit clean. And Dom Reyes, to me, um, he really looked like just a more explosive Gustafson. He used a lot of the similar techniques that Gustafson did, you know, maybe in, in the first fight. Just constant movement. He's got great boxing. Um, but he's an explosive, dangerous guy. And outside of that fourth round, that maybe two or three shots in the fourth round, he really didn't get touched that bad. I mean, I, his head movement was so impressive. And that's I haven't seen someone with that kind of head, head movement in MMA. That that really, really impressed me. So I don't I don't know. I think he's in a weird spot right now where he doesn't know what he wants to do. Does he stay here and just keep adding title defenses or does he seek a gigantic fight against Israel or does he move to heavyweight and try to be a double champ? I don't know. I think there's a lot of confusion around what's going to be next for John. Um, what are you thinking is John's next move? I, th- I think John's ne- I think John will take a rematch with uh, Dom Reyes. If I was to advise John Jones on what his next move should be, and I'm hearing a lot of people say pump the brakes on this, I think he should go to heavyweight right yeah. now because yeah. I think what's happening is I think his body is wearing down. I think just like you mentioned, the the defensive movement, the head movement, the timing, that doesn't happen without a lot of training. I think it, his body's starting to wear down. He's starting to exit his athletic prime and – I think he needs to go to heavyweight right now where there's a lot of aging contenders who are ripe to pick off. He'd have a huge speed advantage, which I think killed him against Dom Reyes is Dom looked like a faster fighter in the first, Uh first couple rounds. And I think he would be able to really, really cement his legacy of I am the greatest of all time. There is no debate because I won light heavyweight and heavyweight. Mm -hmm. And I think now is the time and he should do it. Um, but I do think he ends up taking a rematch with Dom Reyes. I, I don't think he will. I, he played it really calm and really cool after the fight. He was super respectful to Dom Reyes. And then typical John Jones fashion, a day later, he just takes to Twitter and starts blasting the dude. Just talking all kinds of crazy shit. And I don't think he's going to grant Dom Reyes an immediate rematch. Um, what I think is going to happen, what I think needs to happen is he needs to go to heavyweight. I agree. I just think there's not much left for him at light heavyweight besides a lot of danger. You know, these, these guys, they're at the gates and they are every one of them. That is their sole mission is to take out John Jones. Everyone wants to do it. Corey Anderson, Jan Blahovitz, Johnny Walker. They're all gunning for John Jones and honestly, at the moment, I think the big fights are all at heavyweight, unless he can get Israel to move up to light heavyweight, which I don't think is going to happen for, I think Izzy wants to defend his title maybe two or three times and then go after that John fight. So I agree with you. I want to see him go to heavyweight right now. I don't want to see a Dom Reyes rematch. I think it's too dangerous and it's it's not as big of a fight. Any, any Stipe, Francis, DC... All Rumble, Rumble, all four of those fights are much bigger fights than Dom Reyes rematch. Yeah, I agree with you. And I I really think the the clock is ticking on John Jones. I think, you know, I was I was doing some research before this, and when you look at the the dominant guys in the UFC in terms of champions, John is really in a class with GSP, Anderson Silva. And Mighty Mouse. Mighty Mouse, yeah. Every John has been in the UFC for 12 years. Every single one of those guys lost their belt within being in the UFC for 12 years. Every mm-hmm. single one. It was like eight years for Anderson, eight years for Mighty Mouse, nine years for GSP. Like they lost their belt. Mm-hmm. And like that is kind of even among all time greats. 
that is that's the clock. He's doing unprecedented things right now at light heavyweight, and it's only a matter of time. So why would you take that risk against mm-hmm. guys who are not lining your pockets with money and not really cementing your legacy? I agree. And I mean, I think if he makes that move to heavyweight, he could fight two, three, four times at heavyweight and then let light heavyweight sort itself out and then come back for a gigantic fight with Israel Adesanya. But that John Jones last week, how do you think he fares against Israel Adesanya at light heavyweight right now if they were to fight last week? I'd be really scared if I was John against Israel. I think Israel's quick. He's hungry. He's got really weird movement. He's got really precise striking, much better than Dom Reyes. Yeah. I, I mean, uh, we've talked about this. I think Israel Adesanya is on a rocket ship to be not only an all-time great, but perhaps the biggest star in all of MMA. I agree. And, and I just think that that guy beats John Jones at 205, but he's got to cement his legacy at 185. He's got a really tough fight ahead of him. And right. if I'm John... I'm I'm going to wait that out a little bit, see what I could do at heavyweight, and maybe I even get Israel to chase me at heavyweight where I would have a much, much bigger weight advantage. Right. No, I agree. Okay, so for Dom, if he's not able to get this immediate rematch, I, I think he's going to fight the winner of this weekend's fight, Corey Anderson versus Jan Blahovich. Um, I And I think that becomes an interim ch- title shot if John decides to move to heavyweight or the solidified number one contender fight because I don't think – with the win, either of those guys are getting a fight against John. I just don't think he's interested. And like I said, it's not anywhere as near as big a fight as any of those heavyweight fights. Yeah, I uh, I think that's the obvious one. Uh, but to be honest, if I'm Dom Reyes, and I know he's technically retired, but he's still in the UFC rankings, I would be gunning to fight Alexander Gustafsson yeah, right now. Yeah, that's a great fight. I think... I think he's ripe for the picking. I think it's a great fight. I think it's a legacy cementing fight for Dom mm-hmm. Reyes because mm-hmm. he's, a, he's a name, at least among MMA fans. So that's the guy I would be looking to fight. But I agree. I think the natural fit is to match up, you know, the winner of uh, Corey Anderson and Jan Blahovic against Dom Reyes in an in interim title fight if uh, John's not going to fight either the winner of that fight or a Dom Reyes rematch. Right. All right. Well, that's all on John and Dom Reyes. What a fucking fight. That was a great fight. Unbelievable. If you don't like that fight, I don't think you like MMA. Incredibly technical drama on the edge of your seat the whole time. Couldn't look away from the TV. Loved watching it. All right. Let's move on. Valentina Shevchenko versus the blonde fighter. I think you and I were spot on on this. I mean, she's on another level. She's fucking unbelievable. Not only is she on another level, after watching her interviews from Media Day, Parker, I have never been more convinced that Valentina is a Russian spy. (laughs) Are you on the Ben Askren train? Are you kidding me? I love James Bond. Like, Ariel Helwani, Valentina, are you a spy? I am not the spy. That's exactly what a spy would say, (laughs) Valentina. But I am not the spy. Like, you're a spy. We know it. And then she just whoops Caitlin Chukagi and like, Two days later, I'm convinced she's a spy. She needs to be in the next James Bond for sure. Oh, my God. Get her in James Bond, John Wick, Mission Impossible. Any any of these action movies, they could they need some sort of Eastern European woman to come in and kick somebody's ass. She's the one. Call up Valentina Shevchenko. Uh, Nobody's touching her. Nobody's touching her. Not one person. I don't know what else we can say. I, I. I think we called this last week. There's just nothing left for her at that division. I heard, I don't know who it was. um, Someone mentioned the notion that maybe she could drop down to 115. I would be super interested in that arm to get down to that weight. No, I apparently she makes this weight this weight class really, really easy. And I don't, I think she mentioned to someone that she had thoughts of making a cut to 115. That would get my pee really, really hot. I guess, man. I, I, uh, I, I think honestly, like, I just want to see her run through this division. I mean, this is like the Mighty Mouse situation on steroids. Yeah. Like, yeah. this is she is so leaps and bounds better than every single person 
But like, let's see it. Joanne Calderwood, you're next up. Next victim, please. Like, I love that I'll Scottish woman. It. I love Joanne Calderwood. That'd be a great fight. She's awesome. Yeah. She's awesome. And I love watching her fight. Yeah. And Valentina Shevchenko will put her face down on the canvas. Yeah. I, I said, I, I think she's going to go on a kind of a Ronda Rousey-like build or run where she's just blowing through these people. And that's going to set up a gigantic fight with Amanda. I think that's the only fight anyone wants to see, but I don't think it's going to happen for at least a year. I think she's going to have two two to three more fights. And by that time, she's just going to be the hype behind that fight is going to be gigantic. Let her fight Cejudo. Let's go out to like some random Eastern European country. That'll, uh, that'll go to Japan and let's go to Japan. Uh, Fuck it. Let's, let's watch Valentina wheel kick, uh, Henry Cejudo right in his giant noggin. I would love that. (laughs) She knocks him out too, by the way. I don't think triple quadruple C. King of Cringe wants that fight. I don't think anyone wants that fight. Maybe except Amanda Nunes. Right. I mean, you want to talk gangster. I mean, it's it's like you got two killers at 125 and 135 yeah. in the women's division. All right. So she's definitely a spy, and she's one of the best, baddest women on the planet for sure. Um, yeah, book me the Russian spy against Triple C. That's what the let, people want. Let's do it. Black Beast. Back in action at heavyweight, taking on Alir Latifi. Um, this one was close. I I thought this was a very, very close fight. Um, Latifi did everything in his power, I think, to win that fight. I mean, that's how you have to fight Derek Lewis. You have to drag him to the ground, try to control him, make it a boring fight, because that dude is fucking dangerous. I was, <laughs> I had my phone... We were at in Fredericksburg, and we were on a dance floor, me and Leah, and I'm watching Derek Lewis fight while everyone's dancing, and I am going fucking crazy. When he flew across the octagon and threw a flying knee at 265 pounds, are you fucking kidding me? He is so, so scary. Derek Lewis, Derek Lewis says he's finally healthy, and I think that's really scary for a lot of guys. Latifi impressed me. Uh, I mean, what a chin on that guy. Uh, the Greco-Roman wrestling was great. Um, you know, apparently Latifi deadlifts between seven and 800 pounds. I believe it. He's he's got the strength for, uh, for, uh, the heavyweight division. I mean, the guy looks like the human manifestation of like a rock Pokemon. (laughs) Like, uh, but at at the end of the day, I mean, I thought Derek Lewis won. I thought he was, um, did more damage, more effective striker. I thought Latifi didn't do a ton of damage on the ground, so I was happy with that. But let me ask you this, Parker. Did Was I the only one, or did you open up your Uber app and see what it cost to get to Little Woodrow's in Houston after that fight? No. <laughs> what was it? Something stupid. <laughs> it, it was like $250 for me to get from Dallas to Little Woodrow's in Houston. I probably you know could have ripped I it. I thought about it. I probably could have ripped it. Yeah, the I black thought be- about it. The black that, beast that is after the best. party looked great. I also thought he was going to take his pants off again in the interview. Can we please get him on the Joe Rogan experience? I mean, we, there's nothing get him more on, I want. Can we get him on our podcast? That needs to be our I'll goal. Take him. Get the black beast. Uh, that's, after that, I'm going to retire because I will have peaked as a podcast host. 2021 20, goal. Get the black beast on the show. All right. So the black beast got it done again. Um, Honorary gangster, bad motherfucker of the night, James Krause, stepping in on 18 hours notice. I believe he was there to corner and had a hell of a fight. He won the the fight of the night, 50K bonus, uh, just as tough as they come, a veteran. I love watching that dude fight. A lot of respect to James Krause. They should reward him with a top 15 fight at 170 for doing Oh, this. for sure. For sure. I mean, he's he's very good technically. Yeah. He's one of the best coaches in the game. Yep. Um, you know, he was great on great on tough. Uh, I I, I really like James Kraus. I like watching James Kraus. I mean, his jujitsu is really slick. He took Trevin Giles' best shots, which there are middleweights who can't take Trevin Giles' best shots. Yeah, that dude was and, explosive. He was throwing fucking bombs too. So I, I really want to see Kraus fight. You know, I would watch, I think maybe Kraus versus Robbie Lawler. What do you think of that fight? Love it. Love it. We had a uh, Valentine's Day flower crisis. 1-800-Flowers, you are on my shit list. 
ordered flowers this morning at 8.30, and they just arrived at the office at 6.47. Come on, 1-800-Flowers. Get your shit together. Man, I used, a, I used a new flower service this year from you flowers, and it worked out great, Parker. So I'll give you the yeah. website. All right, all right, shoot it to me. All right, Rio Rancho, UFC going down this weekend in New Mexico. Big, big main event fight at light heavyweight. Um, like we just talked about, this is shaping up to be, I, I think it's going to be the next fight for Dom Reyes. Um, we've got Corey Anderson taking on Jan Blahovic. Both of these guys have been on a roll. What are your thoughts on this one? I love Corey Anderson in this fight. I mm-hmm. think Corey Anderson is hungry. I think he's becoming a more complete fighter. Mm-hmm. I think the fact that he was able to outstrike Johnny Walker really shows his development. We know he's a great wrestler. I expect him to come out and wrestle Jan, but I think if this has to stay on the feet, Corey's got going to have no problem. I know Jan is really strong. He's got great power. I think he's a really solid fighter and a top 10 guy at light heavyweight perennially, but... I love Corey Anderson, and I think Corey Anderson is a really scary guy right now in the in the light heavyweight division. Yeah, I agree. I think Corey Anderson's a dark horse of this division, and he has been for the last couple of years. And you'll, if you notice, really the only one that John mentioned in the post fight interviews was Corey Anderson. So I think Corey Anderson is on his radar. Um, I really like Corey Anderson this fight. You know, he hasn't had a whole lot of experience in main events. I think. Jan Blahovich has had maybe three or four main events in the UFC. Um, but Corey Anderson's a guy, I mean, he's going to show up in phenomenal shape. He's just, I agree with you. I think he's became a really, really well-rounded fighter and he's just hungry. He's hungry. He's a hard worker. And I, I think he, he's coming for John. I think he's angry and he wants that fight. He feels like he gets overlooked by everyone and I'm going to look for a big performance from Corey Anderson this weekend. I've got, I think Corey Anderson is going to win a decision. I think it's going to be a hard fought fight, but I think he's going to pull it out and maybe win a unanimous decision over Jan Blahovich. What are you thinking? Yeah, I tend to agree with that. I, I also think it's, it's important to highlight like Mark Henry is still one of the best coaches in this game. I mean, Mm -hmm. he's still putting out really high level guys. I mean, even Frankie Edgar, you know, who is been in this game forever and is not the fighter he used to be by any stretch of the imagination Mm -hmm. is getting by basically purely on technique from the Mark Henry system. Mm -hmm. I think Corey Anderson, a guy who has all the athletic talent in the world is in his prime, hasn't taken a ton of damage. I think he is really primed to fight for that title in 2020. Uh, with Mark Henry in his corner. Yeah, and I think he could be a guy, if John decides to move up to heavyweight for good, I think this could be Corey Anderson's division. I think he's just a super tough guy. Like you said, the coaching behind him is unbelievable. Um, some of the guys that Mark Henry's working with, I mean, look at Zabit, you know, Frankie Edgar, what he's been able to do with him. Marlon um, Marias. Yeah, the rise of Corey Anderson. I Everyone that I hear talk about Mark Henry said he is just like a guru. He's got, they say he's got this underground uh, basement gym that just has all this code on the walls. And that's how he communicates the combos. So he makes it personal for each fighter, whether it's, you know, the combos, their daughter or their dog or whatever. It's, it's just supposed to be unbelievable what this guy does. So, yeah, I'm, I'm looking for a Corey Anderson win. Um, like I said, I think it's going to be a hard fought decision. I think Jan Blahovich is a, he's a tough guy. He's a hard guy to put away. Um, his jiu-jitsu may be something to look for. I think he's a black belt in jiu-jitsu. He's really dangerous off his back. Corey's a great wrestler, but I think he's a purple belt. So hopefully, you know, I think there's going to be some scrambles. Corey should be good, good enough to defend those attacks. Um, but, yeah, I'm, I'm leaning towards a Corey Anderson decision in a very hard, hard-fought fight. Yeah, the question for me is really about Corey Anderson's striking defense because Mm -hmm. I think we saw against OSP, Corey is a guy who he hits hard, his takedowns are explosive, I think he's the better technical fighter shot for shot, Mm -hmm. but at the end of the day, we know Jan Blahovich has huge, huge power in that right hand, Mm -hmm. and if Corey can't, if Corey slips up once, I mean, he could be going to sleep, and so... You know, you know, I love my KSW. 
And Jan is is a legend of KSW. Mm -hmm. And so it pains me to think that this could be the end of the end of the title run for Jan. But um, I do think the shot here for him is if Corey slips up once, he drops his hand or, you know, he throws a, a ugly combo. I think Jan could come through with a big overhand right and put Corey's lights out because Corey's been knocked out before. Well, Jan's great at counter striking. Um, you know, that's how he fights. He fights a lot off the back foot. Corey's a guy that's going to push forward with kind of constant pressure. So for Jan, that's probably his biggest, what he needs to be looking for is to counter off a sloppy combo, maybe when it gets deeper in the rounds. Um, he's also nasty out of the clinch. I mean, you saw how he knocked out Luke Rockhold out of the clinch. Um, he's explosive, and if, if Corey's not minding his P's and Q's, he can get put away by Jan Blahovich. But I think Corey's just going to fight a really smart fight. I think he's going to get it done, and I think he's going to be calling for John Jones, but I don't think he's going to get it. I think Dom Reyes is going to be next, and then the winner of that will earn another fight with John Jones. Um, all right, so both of us have Corey Anderson by decision. Um, next crazy, awesome fight that I am so fucking pumped for is Diego Sanchez taking on, is it Michelle Pereira or Michael Pereira? Michelle, Michelle Pereira. Maybe the two weirdest guys on the roster. Oh my God. I am so excited for this fight. I don't know what the fuck is going to happen in this fight. So Diego Sanchez is training with his like own quote unquote guru at School of Self-Awareness, he's split with Jackson Wink, and he is fighting a guy who just YouTube Michelle Pereira and look at his highlights so from Road FC in Korea, his highlights from his first UFC fight against Danny Roberts. I mean, the guy is, it is the most bizarre fighting style with flips and somersaults and cartwheels and jumping off the wall to try and punch people. And... You know, Diego Sanchez, I mean, we've known he's weird for quite a long time at this point, and I, I just can't wait for this fight. I, I think it's like two absolute lunatics are going to get in that cage and put on a show. I'll be shocked if this doesn't win fight of the night. Yeah, I, I think this is going to be your fight of the night. And Diego Sanchez, I mean, who is aged better in MMA than Diego Sanchez? He has been in some fucking wars over the years. And you hear him talk. I mean, he's definitely out there, but he talks clean, educated. He's deep. He's very thoughtful. I love Diego Sanchez. He is one of my favorite fucking fighters of all time. Him versus Clay Guida is one of the most epic fights of all time. Or his, I, his fight with Gilbert Melendez yeah. is also one of my favorite fights yeah. of all time. Both of those. But Diego Sanchez just keeps doing it. You know, he goes... He's kind of had up and down career the last couple of years, but he's had some really nice wins. Um, the one I saw live in Dallas against Craig White, where he just blew through Craig White and just abused him on the ground. And then he knocked out Mickey Gal. And then he had a kind of weird fight with Michael Chiesa. Um, but I don't know. Everything I've heard from Diego Sanchez this week in his interviews, he seems super sharp. He seems dialed in. I don't know what kind of training he's getting with this guru, whether they're doing yoga and meditating and jerking each other off or what they're doing, but it'll be interesting. I'm, I'm pumped for this fight. This is, this is going to be crazy. I kind of forgot that this was on this card. Yeah. I, uh, it's a little under the radar because I think we had such a big fight card last yeah. week and you know, this is, you know, just kind of a, a run of the mill fight night top to bottom. But um, right before that fight in Dallas, I'll never forget this. So Diego Sanchez is, is really good friends with my, uh, my head jujitsu coach, Alan Moeller, shout out to Moeller MMA. And, uh, he came by the gym before the Craig white fight. And I asked him, I said, Diego, look, you're moving up to 170. You're, you're fighting a guy who's, who's at least six inches, if not taller than you, you know, how do you handle that? And he goes, look. I'm David. He's Goliath. We know how that story ends. <laughs> I mean, this guy is the ultimate underdog mentality. I, I, yeah. I honestly don't know how he's done it. But if you technically look at the Tristan Connolly fight for Michelle mm -hmm. Pereira, which was his last fight that he lost. I mean, Connolly just kind of moved out of the way of all the crazy mm -hmm. flips, 
let Pereira wear himself down and just in the second and third rounds, hit him with blast doubles, took him to the ground, held him down, beat him up with strikes. And that's exactly what Diego Sanchez did to dig to Craig White. So yeah. I, I think he could potentially do it again. I think the route to victory here with Pereira is he's got to catch Diego early. Diego's always been a brawler. He's always been hittable. So if Pereira's really that strong and that explosive, he's got to catch him early. If this is if this fight goes into the second and third rounds into the deep waters, I mean, that's Diego's fight at that point. Yeah, I agree. I, I think if Pereira is going to get this done, he's got to go in there and do some crazy shit and try to get Diego out of there in the first round. If the longer this fight goes, the more it favors Diego Sanchez. You saw Pierre do all that crazy shit on it from his walkout to he's doing flips in the walkout and then he's doing backflips to try to enter the guy's guard. That shit wears you down. You can't do that over three rounds. And if if Diego Sanchez gets him to the ground, he's going to fucking beat the shit out of him. And I, I just don't think Diego Sanchez is a guy that's going to get knocked out by something stupid like that. He's been around forever. And I think he's going to be able to weather the storm of Pierre, although it's fucking crazy and it's going to be a really entertaining first round. I think Diego gets out of that first round. He's able to get a couple takedowns in the second and third round. And then I could see him finishing Pierre in the third round. So I'm going to go. Diego Sanchez is my guy. If you haven't watched Diego Sanchez versus Clay Guida or who's the other one? Um Gilbert Melendez. Who's the other one? Yeah, Gil Melendez. Watch that. And also for your entertainment, go to YouTube and type in Diego Sanchez, yes. When he's walking to the octagon going, yes, yes, yes. <laughs> Fucking love Diego Sanchez. So third round, ground and pound, Diego Sanchez finished. That's what I'm doing. And then he's going to do some weird shit on the mic with his guru. I got him by decision. I don't I don't pick against Diego. You'll never hear me pick against Diego. I'm with you. I this is a Diego Sanchez podcast. Diego, if you want to come on this podcast, if you listen to this, like we will take you anytime, any day. We'll take your guru too. Absolutely love you. You're the best. Hope he wins. Also love Michelle Pereira, but not even close to the love I have for Diego Sanchez. Yeah, it's also fighting in his backyard. I mean, he's fighting in New Mexico. He's used to the altitude, the desert, the training there. I think if it gets out of the first round, it's 100% Diego Sanchez. Um, another fun fight on this, Lando, Venata, Yancy Medeiros. I, I think that could be a, a really, really good scrap. I love watching those guys fight. I'll, those guys have both been in some epic wars. So that's a fight to look out for. Um Nathaniel Wood, I know you're high on him. Um, tell us a little bit about Nathaniel Wood and how you think he's going to fare in a big, pretty big step up in competition against John Dotson, who's been a perennial, I mean, contender at flyweight. This is up at bantamweight. But what do you think about that fight? Yeah, I think John Dodson, he's not exactly a fan-friendly fighter in terms of his style, but I think he's one of the best defensive boxers in the division at bantamweight. He's a perennial top 10 guy. He's been in the top 10 at Bantamweight and at uh, Flyweight. He's he's really been a gatekeeper there. I mean, he hasn't lost to anyone who's not a legit top 10 guy. Yeah. And Nathaniel Wood also has great offensive boxing, but I think where, where Wood really has the advantage here is on. I think if he can get in close to Dodson, kind of cut off the octagon, not let Dodson run away, and and let uh and get a takedown and get to the ground. I actually think he can submit John Dodson because I think his jujitsu is that good. Yeah, no, um, I agree. I, John Dodson, he's a hard guy to hit. You know, I I don't think it's going to be easy for Woods to hit him. Um, he's he's just a weird guy, a tricky guy. Um, but if Woods can go in there and get a finish, that's really, I mean, that's going to skyrocket him into the top 10 at bantamweight. Cause I mean, John Dodson's fought guys like Peter Yawn, Jimmy Rivera, Marlon Marias. None of those guys were able to finish him. They all went to decision. So I, I think this is a really, really good opportunity for Nathaniel Woods to, I mean, put a, a stamp on himself in that division and, and really, you know, jump into the top 10 and have a big year. If he can get past a guy like John Dodson, um, Make your pick. What are you going? What are you saying in this fight? I'm going to take Wood by second round submission. I, I think this okay. kid is really great on the ground. And 
I'd like to see the winner of this fight up against Pedro Munoz at, at Bantamweight. Yeah. I think that's a that's good a great, fight for the winner fight. of this uh, for this yeah. fight. No, absolutely. I'm going to take Woods by decision. I think it'll be a, a good fight. Um, I think you'll see, we'll be able to see all his skills and what he can do in there. And I, I just think Do- John Dodson's a really hard guy to finish. Um, but I'm going to go Woods by decision. Um, friend of the show, Brock Weaver, making his UFC debut. He looked pretty good at the weigh-ins today in his uh, Native American garb. So um, watch out for him. Hopefully we'll be able to track him down for an interview after this. Um, but I, I think he's he's a guy, and you and I have talked about this, but I think Brock Weaver's the guy to look out for. He made a pretty big splash on the Contender Series. He's a hugely marketable guy. Obviously, he's got the Native American background, and I think he's a guy that UFC can really build into a star. So be on the lookout for Brock Weaver this weekend. Yeah, and I think with Brock, the thing is, I think his his record is actually a little deceiving. I think a lot of people would look at right. it and say, wow, he's got a lot of losses, but the reality is, is the guy's been fighting since he was like 17, 16, 17 years old using fake IDs. So I think, yeah. uh, I think he's really matured as a fighter. He's starting to take it a lot more seriously. And right. I, I agree with you. I think he's really marketable and I think he's got a fan friendly style. So I, I would definitely watch out for Brock Weaver, uh, making his UFC debut this weekend. Yeah. And I think he's on a seven fight winning streak too. So, um, Keep an eye on him, but I mean, if he can make a big splash, he he's a guy that, you know, on a card like this, I think he's on the main card too. I think he's like the second or third fight on the main card, um, but he's a guy that can make a name for himself really quickly in this, in this company. So, um, all right, that's pretty much it. So decent card this weekend. Not great. Let's, um, there, I mean, important fight at light heavyweight, and then Diego Sanchez is fighting that freak show. So those are going to be the two that I'm really tuned in for. Um, but yeah, that's going down Saturday. Let's dive into real quick, um, current events. So we'll just blow through these. We got a couple minutes here. Um, Nate Diaz, Dustin Poirier going back and forth. That's, that's gotta happen. I love that fight. Yeah. I still want McGregor versus Diaz three, to be honest. I I just think it's, it's a better fight. It's, it's better for where the two are at. And yeah, I think. I think we've talked about this, but I think McGregor is either fighting Nate Diaz or Justin Gaethje next. And whichever of those two guys doesn't get picked for the McGregor sweepstakes, I think they'll end up fighting uh, Dustin Poirier. And I would favor Poirier in both matchups. I I basically think if your name isn't Khabib, McGregor, or Tony Ferguson, Dustin Poirier is going to beat you in that 155-pound division. You would take Poirier over Gaethje right now? Yes, absolutely. Really? I'll disagree with you on that. I think Justin Gaethje is on another level right now, and I don't think anyone's beating him until he gets to that title fight. Um, yeah, I don't, I don't know. I mean, this fight, obviously, everything right now at 155 and 170 is kind of waiting on Conor McGregor. I mean, you're not going to get a gigantic fight until Conor McGregor f- picks who he's going to fight. And then I agree with you. I hope it's Nate. I think it's either going to be Nate or Justin. Um Nate to me is the best fight, the most winnable fight for Connor. If they go that route, I I wouldn't mind seeing Justin take on Dustin Poirier in a rematch. I think that's a phenomenal fight, and I think that's your number one contender fight, clear cut number one contender fight at one fifty five. So yeah, they were going back and forth. I think um, Dustin, for whatever reason, wants that fight. It's obviously a big fight. It's probably the biggest fight he can get right now. But that'll be interesting to see how that all shakes up. I think it's. Honestly, it's right around the corner. We got Khabib, Tony, and April. I think shit's going to start falling in place right after that. So everyone get your popcorn ready. It's, it's going to get crazy here in a second. Um, next one, this is a sad one. BJ Penn, back in the headlines for all the wrong reasons. DWI, um, DWI in Hawaii, he, he just had a couple months ago was released from the UFC after I think he had two or three brawls outside of a bar. It's not looking good for BJ Penn. And it's very, very sad. This is a legend in the sport and a guy that you just hate to see it in like this, but it doesn't look like it's going to end well for BJ Penn. It just keeps getting worse and worse. Yeah. I, I hate seeing these headlines about BJ Penn. I mean, he's one of the guys who got me interested in the sport in the first place. I mean, he was such Mm -hmm. a phenom. Um, 
you know, coming out of Hawaii and, you know, was willing to fight anyone, was was really at one point one of the best pound for pound fighters in the world. Um yeah. and it, it's really it's crushing and I, I just hope he gets help. I, I hope his his loved ones and his friends really push him to get help and, and BJ I, I think, you know, we're we're sad for you, man, and, and we really just want you to get better and and to deal yeah. with the demons that you're dealing with. So um, I, I just, I, I, I hate seeing these, to be honest, Parker. Yeah. Yeah. It's hard to see. Um, yeah. We hope BJ gets better. Um, this was a big one for me. Lovato Jr. Gives up his middleweight strap. We saw him on Joe Rogan. He had talked about the brain issues he was having. And then you have a mega fight in Bellator. 170 pound. Douglas Lima, the champion Douglas Lima taking on legend Gegard Mousasi in a middleweight fight. Um, I love this fight. I just, I think this is a really big ask for Lima. And I, I, I was live when Rory took on Mousasi and tried this route up at 185. And I don't know. I, I'm really, really nervous for Douglas Lima on this one. Uh, what do you think initially? Parker? I'm picking Douglas Lima to win this fight and become the next Bellator double champ. I think he's that good. I think Musasi has lost a step. I don't think Bellator motivates Musasi all that much. I think his fight against Lyoto Machida really showed me a lot that this guy's just not as quick as he used to be. He's not as willing to grapple. Um, I think Lima has really underrated grappling. Um, I think we saw against Lovato, who's... You know, a good striker, not a great striker, but he was really getting the better of exchanges with Gegard Mousasi during their fight. Um, I'm going to pick Douglas Lima. I think Douglas Lima wins this fight. I uh, I really want to see them book uh, John Salter against Anatoly Tokov, which are two, two Bellator middleweight contenders as kind of a number one contender fight underneath this. Yeah. Um, but I, I really like Douglas Lima in this fight. I think he's really just on the top of his game right now, and Gegard Mousasi just isn't. Yeah, I think Gegard Mousasi is kind of in this John Jones space. He's a guy that's been around. I mean, he fought in pride, and he's just a guy that's been fighting since he was 18, 19 years old. I still think at any any given night, he could be a, one of the best fighters in the world. I just, I agree. Um, I saw him fight Rory, and... Rory, to me, is a top five fighter in the world at that time when they fought, and he just blew the fucking doors off of Rory, took him down, and just beat him to death, and there was nothing Rory could do. Um, He's a big guy. You got to remember that he's fought up at, I think he's fought at 205 and heavyweight throughout throughout his MMA career, so he's a big guy in there, and when he got in there with Rory, I mean, there was a noticeable difference, and... I think it just matters what Musasi do you get that night. Do you get a motivated Musasi who's been training, who's world class? Because Douglas Lima is going to bring it. You know what Douglas Lima is, and and he's coming. He's coming for you. So for Bellator, this is a great fight. Uh, this is a phenomenal fight. I, I would think Bellator would hope Lima can get it done because he's a guy that, I mean, that you can build a company around Lima. He's a world class fighter. So I'm really, really looking forward to that. Um, Awesome move by Bellator. Bellator is just fucking crushing it right now. They're on fire. I mean, their yeah. their cards are really unbelievable right now. I'm I'm really excited with what they're doing. It's distinctly mm-hmm. different from what the UFC is offering, which I think is really the route that they have to go. And uh, I'm really looking forward to that card, which which has the light heavyweight uh, title on the line with uh, Bader versus Vadim Nemkov out of Team mm-hmm. Fedor. So uh, I'm I'm really excited for for what Bellator's got got cooking up over the next few months. All right, two more headlines, and then we will get out of here. The UFC is returning to Dublin August 15th. Are we booking our tickets, or what are we doing? Oh, I would love nothing more than to be in the Let's three go. arena. Um, I, I, I think this is kind of the obvious date for McGregor, right? I think um, you could sell it as a pay-per-view, They've clearly done it with uh, with Abu Dhabi this year. I, I don't think the time difference really matters in terms of being able to sell a pay-per-view. I just think you got to bring McGregor back to Dublin and 
he'll come off as such a star. Hopefully he can win back the Irish people again. And I would love to see it. And quite frankly, if you're not going to bring McGregor back, I don't know who you have that can legitimately headline this card. Yeah, because Bellator has kind of dominated the Irish fighters. I mean, they pretty much, they have all the Irish fighters out of SBG. So I don't know. I think August is a stretch. You think it's going to be that long until McGregor fights? I think he wants a springtime, summertime fight. I do. I definitely do. But I think they could convince him just because Dublin is such a draw for him. Um, yeah. I think that could be that could be a bargaining chip for them. But, I mean, we'll see. The, guy, the other guy that they could potentially headline it with is Gunnar Nelson. But I think that's kind of a weak headliner, to be honest. I think that's well, more of a or- co-main event. Yeah, I mean, you got Leon Edwards, Darren Till. Both of those guys are huge in the UK if if Edwards can get past Tyron Woodley. And then who knows what's going on with Darren Till and the uh, Killer Gorilla. They've kind of been going back and forth. Yeah, I've heard a lot of rumors that that's not going to happen on March 7th. So maybe they do put Darren Till in Dublin, but kind of seems odd to take a Liverpool guy and in your return to Dublin and your return to Ireland, you throw him in there um, yeah. rather than, than saving it to have, to have Connor fight in his hometown. Yeah. The other thing to note, it is a fight night. So they would definitely have to make that a pay-per-view. Connor's not going to fight on a non-pay-per-view card. Yeah. So I don't really know, honestly, what they're doing there. It kind of seems odd to me. And it, Seems like the ship has sailed on the UFC in Ireland and, and Bellator has really moved in there and taken over. Okay, last thing, and then we will get out of here so our girlfriends don't fucking kill us. Um, Manny Pacquiao signs with Conor McGregor's Paradigm uh, Sports Management. Any thoughts on that? I think this is a fight that could happen down the line. I don't think this fight happens in 2020. I think the absolute earliest this would happen would be in 2021. And I think it only yeah. happens if Connor regains an MMA world title. So I, I think people love to speculate and it's fun. And, you know, they're two of the biggest stars in combat sports. But at the end of the day, it's, it's a bit of a non-story for me. I think Connor's trying to double dip. He's going to build up that fight and he's going to fucking cash in. And I agree. I don't think it's going to be this year. I think this year is going to be Connor in MMA. But 2021, I can guarantee, I will bet my left testicle that Connor McGregor fights Manny Pacquiao or Floyd Mayweather in boxing. And they're going to sell out some gigantic arena and everyone's going to get paid. And I guarantee you, Dana White figures a way to get Zufa boxing involved with that. So those are my bold predictions. Here's my question to you, Parker, and then we'll leave it after this. Okay. Which which of these three fights is the most likely to happen? Manny okay. Pacquiao against Floyd Mayweather two, Manny okay. Pacquiao against Conor McGregor, or Conor McGregor against Floyd Mayweather two. Conor versus Floyd. I think that's the most likely one to happen. They've done business before. Floyd's got a relationship with Dana White. I think. They'll all find a way to work together. McGregor Entertainment, the UFC, Zufa Boxing, and you know Money Mayweather Promotions. They saw how much money they can make the last time, and I think they'll do it again. You know, they're just going to cash in, and I think that's the most likely one. All right, I got I got my money on on Floyd versus Pacquiao too. I think that's the most likely to happen. I think that's the most dangerous fight for Floyd right now. Yeah, but I also think Floyd realizes that it's going to be hard to hoodwink people twice on the McGregor thing. And I think Manny Pacquiao is the biggest payday in boxing he could get with the least risk. Yeah, I want to see Bud Crawford and Manny Pacquiao. That's the fight I want to see. So you want Manny Pacquiao to get killed? No, Manny Pacquiao, I think, can still hang. You, he's 41 years old and he has looked fucking phenomenal. Um, I don't know. I, I think those three, they're going to be tied together for the next couple of years. There's going to be a lot of rumors, but I think eventually you're going to get Connor versus Floyd. Yeah. So that's what I think. Um, yeah. So decent week of fights, obviously a lot of headlines around the John Jones fight. And I think we're sleeping on what's next weekend. Tyson Fury versus Deontay Wilder. Are you fucking kidding me? 
That's the twenty second. Oh. It's already here. It's I here. can't believe it, man. I actually watched I watched the first fight today and I, I couldn't yeah. be more excited for that. We're gonna have to jump on next week and talk a little boxing. I think so. I think we may even have to have a boxing segment this week. Sorry to all the MMA purists. Yeah, we're gonna do it. This this is a gigantic fight. This is Ali Frazier. I mean, this is gonna be awesome. I'm so pumped for this fight. Um all right, so let's wrap it up. It's Valentine's Day. We're going to get fucking scolded if we don't get off the air. Um, Parker's MMA Show, episode 23. We are rocking and rolling. We're going to keep them coming. Everyone, please give us likes, subscriptions, uh, share. Tell your friends about it. If they like fighting. Me and Billy will keep it coming. Any Parker's last MMA Show on, uh, yeah. on Facebook, Twitter, and YouTube. Please look us up. Subscribe, like the page, follow the Twitter account. Um, we'll be posting, we'll be talking about fights and, uh, you know, look forward to, to chopping it up with you next week, Parker. Till next time. Happy Valentine's day, everyone. Cheers. Signing off. All right. Later. Later. Thanks for listening to Parker's MMA show. Take a moment to rate and review on Apple podcast or wherever you get your podcast and visit Parker Keen's MMA show.podbean.com for additional information on Parker and to stay up to date on the latest drama in the fight world. For more information and important links about today's episode, check out the show notes.